Well, all right. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and thank you so much for joining me today on Adobe Live for today's session, which is um, mixing sound for a short film. So this is something that we've tackled on some of the previous video and audio masterclasses held on Fridays at 10.30 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. But today I thought I'd take a slightly different approach by introducing sort of a combination of using the track mixer, which is a more traditional styled mixer or mixing environment, as well as integrating some of the essential sound panel into the mix. And for those of you unfamiliar, the essential sound panel was um, developed a couple of years ago as a way for really non-audio professionals to very efficiently mix audio for video or mix audio to picture. Um, it has incredible power, great flexibility, but the idea behind Essential Sound is that it's it's a very simple implementation. So I'm going to showcase a little bit of both here, um, giving you some of the kind of basic fundamentals of how I would set up a mix with the track mixer first, doing some basic organization things to kind of get things ready and together and just make it easier to start navigating the mix and then, you know, begin individually tweaking different elements as we see fit or as needed. So um, as always, of course, we've got a long schedule today. I'm very happy to be the first, <laughs> your first cup of coffee uh, this morning, but we have a full day of, of learning and uh, social social distance learning for you today here on Adobe Live. So I'm with you from 7.30 until 9 a.m. Pacific. Uh, at 9 a.m., we've got Jesus coming up with a Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge. 9.30, we've got uh, photo retouching with Weekend Creative. At 11.30, back with the um, Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge with Andrew. Then at noon, we've got Branding and Identity with Nina from Weekday Studio. 2 o'clock this afternoon, uh, my colleague Howard Pinsky will be doing the Adobe XD Daily Creative Challenge. 2.30, another colleague of mine, your friend and mine, Kyle T. Webster, will be doing a draw-along. And then at 3 p.m., the design off with Voodoo Val and Logan Faber. So you'll be sure to want to um, stick around for all of those things. Of course, you'll be able to watch all the replays here on Adobe Live or on the Creative Cloud YouTube channel. It's also worth pointing out that uh, while we will be having another video daily creative challenge coming up in the coming weeks, trying to determine um, exactly when that's going to happen right now, wanted to also point out to you that we have a new Premiere Pro or a new Adobe Video Discord channel that I would highly recommend you sign up for and start leveraging. Um, this is a new community. We've grown it almost 10x since the DCC aired a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's a fabulous way for you to connect with peers, connect with people who are doing the same kinds of things that you're doing. And uh, I've just been impressed with how much everyone has just been so positive and encouraging in there. Really, really cool and very, very nice to see everybody kind of just working together and trying to help one another and inspire one another. And uh, what can I say? It's just lovely to see the fruits of the Adobe Live community come alive in Discord, all right? So as always, we're coming to you live on a series of different networks. Now, the conversation for today's class is happening over at behance.net slash Adobe Live. So that is the chat I'm going to be following. But for those of you who've joined us on Twitter and Periscope, hello, Scribs, hello, Olga Sessions, Kotamaru, not your typical man, 74, nice to see you, Karen Heffernan, Abhijit from Mumbai, great to see you. Carrie Latimer from Scotland, oh, very nice to see you as well. Sam KP and Sam Peterson, oh, what's up, man? Nice to see you. All right, we've got Bill Vincent from Bradenton, Florida. Eric, very nice to see you. Andreas, Richard Newberry, Pulak Roy, Manonda, Jesse, great to see you all. And then uh, let's see, what else have we got over here? Emil, hello, how's it going? And Kirby P Films. Thank you so much. Ah, very kind of you to say that. Thank you so much. Okay, so again, if you want to follow the conversation, please join me over at behance.net slash Adobe Live. That is the chat that I'm going to be following uh, for the day. All right. Very, very cool. Okay, so let's go ahead and switch over. Got a bunch of stuff to cover today and I uh, want to make sure we have ample time to do it. And of course, with these streams, um, I will be taking questions kind of, you know, in between as we're moving and navigating and doing different things in here. So this content uh, is some stuff that I've shown before from a short film called Two Step. And uh, I've since uh, added, I added some additional sort of underscore and music to it. Now, when we begin the process of kind of breaking down how to begin, you know, a mix, whether it's for a short film or a commercial or even a YouTube video, 
you know, first thing, once you've got everything kind of laid into the timeline, and this is typically what I'll do is that, you know, <clears throat> assuming the scene and everything is all cut together, uh, and once I get some basic, if there is sound design and if there if there is music and sort of other elements, just to have a simple playback, just to kind of hear everything where it is. Now, in the case of the music here in particular, um, I've currently disabled some of the effects that I already uh, stuck on there. And we'll, we'll kind of go through what I did with them. I just, d d in the essence of time, put some things in there. They're all disabled, though. You can see they're all, everything is turned off. So I'm just going to drop the amplitude of this first music track here because without the parametric EQ that I have implemented there, it's actually quite a bit louder. So I'll drop this down to around minus 9. We'll bring it back up to minus 4 in just a minute. And I'm going to grab my headphones here. And then we're just going to play through this. It's... Uh, it's a little, it's about a minute and a half, all right? But this is just so that you can get a, a good idea of where we are, what everything sounds like. I might even turn the music off halfway through if it's kind of getting in the way. But this is first going to showcase to you, how does everything sound before it's mixed? How consistent is the dialogue? How even are all the dialogue performances? If it's for a short film or some, or some kind of narrative piece like that, it's very possible that you might have replaced or redone some of the dialogue concept known as ADR, all right, dialogue replacement, uh, whether that was done in the studio or on set. So as a result of that, the levels between, you know, the original raw take and then your overdub take can be different. So these are the kind of things that we're going to listen for. How, how different are the levels on an individual speaker's performance? How different are the levels between, in this case, two characters in the scene? And then all of the elements around it, all right? Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, let's take a quick listen to this first, all right? And I see Eric is saying, I've never used the audio track mixer panel. <laughs> and that's why we do these things. Incidentally, um, I am kind of in our audio workspace here inside of Premiere. Um, you can also access this from the window menu under workspaces. I've obviously modified it a bit for the stream. I don't know that it actually has the audio track mixer in there. So that too is a, is something that you can access here under the window menu. Now, I also want to point out just real quickly, um, we have two, well, three basically, but we, we also have this audio clip mixer. And this allows you, if I just pull this up real quickly, this allows you to adjust amplitude of clips on a track. I very seldom use this though, because generally, uh, any kind of clip volume changes, I'll do right on the clip with uh, with envelopes, with keyframes. And then all the effects and things, again, if I want, generally I'm applying effects globally to a track because I try and organize things that way. Um, but you can also do clip-based effects, which only affect that single clip versus a track-based effect. We'll get to that in just a few moments. I almost, in fact, I just, I'll, I never use the clip mixer, ever, never. There's... I, some people do. It's fine. I think people confuse it with the concept of the track mixer, though. So again, the track mixer, when you apply effects and things, applies to every clip that lives on that track. You still have all the same automation capabilities. You can still individually treat things. But again, effects and things applied to the track apply to every clip that lives in that track. All right, so let's play this back. I'll go ahead and just uh, let's make this full screen here for the purposes of... Actually, let me. I'll minimize it first just to check our individual levels, and then we'll go full screen on it. Here we go. Take a listen. Well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional, and you're what they call can't win for losing. She tell you she took it all? She took the whole damn score? What she did is she paid me what she owed me for her half. But I, don't, I didn't get any of the money. Why, why do I have to pay you if I don't get any of it? Oh, you got it, Liv. You got it. You just lost it. You just lost it. And that ain't my fault. Besides, I gave you the tools. I gave you the phones. I gave you the scripts. I told you what to do, and I told you how to do it. But I don't have the money. Okay. 
That music gets a little strange at the end there. Okay. So again, uh, you saw I dropped the, that music uh, quite, a, quite significantly there just so that we could hear the dialogue a little bit better. But overall, as a starting point, um, it's pretty good. And, you know, again, depending upon how you are tracking things, you know, when you're working on set naturally, um, you know, even even with a small crew, there's all kinds of potential for noise and other just incidental things that creep up into your recording, which is why a lot of times dialogue has to be replaced. In fact, there's at least one or two clips in here you may not have noticed necessarily where they they replace the dialogue after the fact. And it was probably just it was too noisy on set or they just didn't get the sound. Some, something with a sound just didn't quite work and they had to redo it. So um, this is a really common process. But overall, everything sounds pretty decent. Now, one of the things that um, I typically talk about when we are talking about the essential sound panel is a function in there that we have to uh, allow you to uh, tag all of your media so that Essential Sound knows what to do with it. We're gonna get to that in a minute here um, because I really wanna focus more on using the, the sort of manual audio track mixer for the start. So to do that, a couple of housekeeping things that I always do. <coughs> Excuse me. First and foremost, and this is not unlike something that will be familiar to many of you, uh, to all of us really, who work in Photoshop, Naming your layers, naming your tracks, okay? So this is not a massive session by any stretch. We have all of five audio tracks here, three tracks of dialogue, all labeled in blue. It's also a good idea to, to, adva to take advantage of all the various labels in Premiere. You'll see this if you check out, in fact, yesterday, if, if you do a, a hashtag search on uh, Twitter or Facebook for Timeline Tuesday, take a look at, you know, at different timelines from, you know, I'm not saying look at look at the pros, but look at people who do a lot of editing, and you'll see that they take advantage of color coding. It makes your life so much easier. To color code a clip or a series of clips is as simple as right-clicking or control-clicking on it, and then going to label, and you'll see here that you have all these various label colors available to you. All of these, by the way, by the way, are editable um, under your preferences as well. So this allows me just to kind of visually identify, okay, everything in this you know, this sort of pale blue, this is dialogue, this yellow, that's my main music. And then the stuff that's kind of in this mango orange, that's some of the the incidental underscore. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. So, um, so again, so just kind of visually coordinating the look of things is a good way to start. Second part, of course, is to label those tracks. Even though there's only five, it can certainly get confusing and you just you just get lost in it. So it's really important. There's two characters here, Webb and Dwayne, um, based on how some of the audio was captured. You can see up here on track one, there's a couple clips that actually contain audio from both of them. Again, I didn't try, this is not my footage. I didn't, I didn't film this on site, but for whatever reason, the good clip they needed had this kind of combined performance. So there's a couple clips, they're on track one. Webb by himself is on track two. Dwayne is on track three. A4, I've got music one. A5, I've got music two. And then we have our master fader here. Also worth pointing out, for this particular mix, we're working in stereo. Now, I get asked this question a lot. People are like, oh, cool. How can I take this and how do I make my 5.1 mix from this session as it is? Okay. Well, the short answer is you need to build your sequence. You need to start your sequence either by choosing a sequence preset that already has a 5.1, if you were doing surround, uh, a 5.1 master fader, meaning that there's six output channels on the master, or in the case of if you were working and doing something with ambisonics and VR, choosing a, a sequence preset that has an ambisonic four channel master. If you simply go up to sequence settings at the top here, and you're getting you're getting a little bit of additional learning here in terms of how you're organizing your sessions when you begin your mixes, and this is something that kind of confuses people, you'll notice that while you can change editing mode, time base, frame size, you can change basically all the elements of video, even video previews and VR properties. The one thing you can't change once the sequence is created is the channel format. All right. So if you started with a stereo uh, a stereo master, this sequence is stereo. You can't suddenly convert this into a six channel master and then remix it for, for multi-channel. So to do that, you would have to create a new sequence from the start 
and just give it a, 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 a 5.1 master. You can do that. I don't know if you're going to be able to see the icon. It's Oh, it's down here. You can see the little tooltip right there. New item. This is inside the project panel, which is hidden behind my camera right here. And if we choose sequence, all right, this is where we could go into something like our new sequence dialog here. All right, now I usually, because I'm, I'm typically working in 1080p, I often go with the digital SLR presets, uh, 23976 for my frame rate. But here's where you can go into your settings, right? This looks familiar, all right? Obviously, we're in 48K. Um, but if you go into tracks, now this is where you can determine what that master is going to be. So if we wanted to make a 5.1 master, I would choose 5.1. Okay, and then you can you can always add and change the configuration of your track types after the fact. That doesn't matter. It's more about that master fader. Okay, you're typically not going to have five dot one audio tracks in a five mix in a five one mix. You could. It's not exactly common because again, your raw elements are going to be mono voiceover. You know mono sound design, stereo sound design, stereo music, all living inside of this multi-channel environment, okay? So it's really important. I get asked that all the time, especially when you, people are like doing this exact kind of thing. Oh, I'm creating a mix for YouTube. I'm gonna do it in stereo. Oh, but I'm also gonna make a Blu-ray and I wanna do a 5-1 mix. How do I just like convert this session? Well, you can import the existing session into a new sequence, right? But you have to build the sequence from scratch with that 5.1 master. So let's just say I did this. We'll call this two-step 5.1 and click OK. All right. Now, just for just to showcase here, you'll see that. So on each of our tracks, now you're going to get this individual multi-channel panner. So you can control the 5.1 positioning of your mono or stereo content in 5.1. But most importantly, if you look at the master fader, you can see these six divisions <laughs> right here. So this is telling you that this is a, a 5.1 master. All right. So just something to point out. Again, that's not what we're working with today, but I get asked this a lot. All right. Very cool. All right. Yes, Eric. Yes. Hashtag timeline Tuesday. Correct. Okay. Very good. All right. So we've named our tracks. We've color coded our tracks. Now, Something else to keep in mind, and this is, again, a practice that I always use uh, because in, in the end, it just makes life a lot easier. Now, you're, you're going to have to typically treat each individual clip. That's just the way it is. Now, again, you can do this via Essential Sound. We're going to focus more on the audio track mixer here. But one thing that I'll do right away is to create a submix or a subgroup for all of the dialogue because once all of the individual clips are treated, and by treated, I mean, maybe you need to remove some noise, right? Maybe there was some room ambience that you didn't like. Maybe each of them needs a little bit of EQ. Again, they're all living on the same track, each character. So maybe I can get away with using the same EQ for everything. Maybe I need to use a clip-based effect, just an EQ on a single clip, and then everything else can use kind of a global effect, different ways to approach it. But once all of that's done, I like having all of my dialogue on a single stereo fader so I can apply a global compression, which is going to even out the dynamics in a uniform way so that all of the dialogue, after it's individually treated, just kind of sits right there in the mix. And again, it's just very present and consistent, and it's easy to control everything simultaneously. Does that make sense? All right. Checking so in the chats here. Okay. Yes. All right. Billy Surf Martin, what's up? Herb, what's happening? AGB, I think Clip Mixer is an easy way to new users and mixing audio. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, again, fair enough. Um, it is. Where I think the, the Clip Mixer gets confusing is it still appears, and, and I'm just reading a comment here, just, just to show you this one more time. What's confusing about this and why I don't typically use this is that, again, it's a clip mixer. So you see these faders and you're thinking, oh, OK, uh, that that applies to sort of everything in this track. But it's it's really about what clip you have in focus and then adjusting volume and pan on that clip. So, yes, it's a, it's a decent way if you're wanting to do quick volume adjustments. It just doesn't give you the uh, the visual overview if you're trying to identify something, I again, I think it's okay. Um, 
I, I just never really got into it. Maybe that's just because I'm from a more traditional uh, mixing background. But yes, absolutely. Whatever you feel comfortable with. I mean, that's the thing. Do it however you like. There's always multiple ways to do things in Premiere, and that's what's so nice about it. All right. Cal, what's up? Hey, never late, always on time, as, as I like to say. Okay, so let's go ahead and create that submix. Now, this particular submix, what we're doing is we're creating essentially a group. I'm not using a, a submix for the purposes of creating um, an effects send, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but you create it from the same from the same location. So up here, under our uh, and by the way, I should point out in your audio track mixer, it's going to open up like this, not expanded. So you're going to have these big long faders, mute solar record. This is your automation, pan left and right, output, and then your input channel. Okay. You can see currently they're all going to the master. So if you twirl this down, this little triangle right here, you can see there's a tooltip that says show hide effects and sends. Go ahead and twirl this down. And at the top here, we have our effects inserts. This is where you would insert or, or place things like um, equalization. So you would place an EQ. It's very common to use an EQ in an insert position. Um, most commonly, you would apply compression or limiting on an insert. And the concept of an insert is you're sending the audio to an effect and you're immediately sending it back, okay? Ascend, which is down here, that's this second section here, and they're indicated by these two different icons, FX, and then this little patch cable for send. Ascend allows you to basically take that existing audio and send it to another fader, to some other place. They can coexist in two places, but this allows you to send that signal somewhere else so that you can independently apply things to it versus the insert where you're sending it someplace and then it's coming right back. So it's one location. You only There's one control. The send allows you to place it somewhere else and then have multiple control capabilities, okay? Gets a little confusing. You'll follow me along. You'll, you'll understand what's happening here. So to create a send group, we're going to click on this down arrow here and I'm going to create a stereo submix. Okay, let's go ahead and create a stereo submix for this. And again, this is going to house all of the voices so that once they're all individually treated, I can control their volume in the mix with a single fader, with a single slider. Create stereo submix. All right, and I'm actually going to, it's called submix one for right now. Let's scroll over here and we're going to rename this dialogue with the US English spelling. Most of you know I typically type it like that, but that, that it gets slightly cut off and that bothers me. So we're just gonna call this dialogue, okay? Now I took it out of this send position here. The reason for that is uh, I'm not trying to send it over there so that I have two places where I can control volume. I don't want that. I want to group everything over to that submix. So for that, where it says master, this is your track output, okay? This is going to allow you to take everything that you've applied, so all of your inserts, along with, uh, uh, um, again, whatever effects you may have in here, you can then route those to some other output, to some other fader. I don't want it to go to the master, I want it to go to that dialogue submix, okay? And then the dialogue submix, goes to the master, all right? So we're gonna send this to the dialogue submix. Next one, dialogue. Next one, dialogue, okay? Let's go ahead and just mute the music here so that you can see how this all works. Scroll over here. So if we're playing this back now, just our dialogue, and you can see now we have our dialogue grouped fader. Blaine, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. A Amy just, she split and took it all. She if I grab this fader now, this will silence all of that dialogue simultaneously. Here we go. You'll see. All right. Well, I talked to Amy. All right. So you can see it's still playing out on the individual channels here, but now this fader. She tell you she took it all? The whole damn score? What she did is she paid me. That fader now controls the mix of everything together. Okay. 
So again, once we get everything treated, we add EQ, we add compression, whatever we need to do to really finesse each of these individual clips. When it's all ready, when it's all said and done, now not only can I control the volume of everything, but I can control the dynamics of everything globally. You still may, to, may need to control dynamics on individual clips as well, right? Audio mixing can get really deep and really complex, and it just depends how far you want to take things and how far you need to take things. If you're doing a really small production and stuff is very cleanly and easily recorded, you probably don't need to do all that much. For something like this, where there's a lot of back and forth, again, there's a lot of ambient sound that I'm hearing, there's some dialogue replacement, things are going to need to be tweaked a little bit more to really kind of homogenize and even them out, all right? Okay. The OCD, yeah, right. Submix. Yes. Right? Also known as a bus, also known as a group. Right? Lots of different terms for the same thing. So the key is we're just sending all of that audio to one fader so it can be controlled uh, in um, globally just very easily. Again, kind of after the fact, though. We're going we're gonna to treat all of that later. All right. So the first thing we want to do is start going through these individual clips and just kind of listening to what each of them sounds like by character. So since uh, the, it starts with uh, Webb here, that's this dude right here. But Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. A Amy just, she split and took it all. She... All right. Let's just go ahead and solo his stuff and just listen, all right? And it's really important to listen critically we're listening for, is there noise? Are, uh, is, it, is it crispy? Is it too bright? Is it, you know, what does it sound like? What is it missing? All right. And we're just going to kind of scrub through each, each little clip. He's got about four separate sections here to hear what they sound like. All right. Let's take a listen. But Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. A Amy just, she split and took it all. She... All right. Next. She tell you she took it all. She took the whole damn score. All right, now you can hear there's a little bit more ambient noise on here. You might need, I don't know if you're in headphones. Um, incidentally, I did place, someone may notice that there is a multiband compressor on our master here. Just want to point out that all I did for this, I'm using the brick wall limiter simply to amplify the audio for the stream. Now, I will often put a, a multiband compressor on the master here. I'm not actually using any of the compression here. I'm just using the brick wall limiter just to amplify the overall stream um, to bring up some of that ambience and background noise. But if you're listening carefully, she tell you she took it all. She took the whole damn score. And you can even see it visually that there's there's a decent amount of some kind of just noise. It's not bad. It's just room ambience, or maybe it's like a car driving by outside, but it's not silent, all right? And similarly, you know, there's, uh, if we if we scroll back, you know, there's also some of that noise here at the end. In fact, this already sounds somewhat cleaned up. He split and took it all, she... All right, so it's a little bit noisier here. She tell you she took it all. She took the whole damn score. All right, next one. But I, I didn't get any of the money. Why, why do I have to pay you if I don't get any of it? <laughs> oh, you got it, Liv. You got it. You just lost it. All right. Now, that particular clip, again, how they organized it, it's actually the two of them captured on here. So this one's going to be a little tricky. And then the last piece. But I don't have the money. All right. Okay, so overall, here's what I would say about these. His dialogue, his speaking level is all pretty consistent. That's a good thing. There's definitely, you know, some room ambience, which maybe we need to tackle. We'll know a little bit more about this once we listen to Dwayne, our other character here. All right, where it looks like there's only two individual clips of his. So let's take a listen to those, all right? Eric, can you comment on the basic function of a compressor? Yes, in just a moment, okay? So let's go ahead and listen to these. Here we go. Well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional, and you're what they call can't win for losing. All right, now, right away, one of the first things, which if you're listening critically, there's a very different sound to this. This one sounds very boxy, okay? 
Now, it could be that uh, this was mic'd or boom mic'd with a different microphone. It sounds like he's a bit what's known as off axis. So it has this kind of roomy, boxy sound. And there's a different noise characteristic. So to put it in perspective, listen to uh, Webb here. Money, Amy just, she split and took it all. She... All right. He sounds like he's like sort of directly speaking on a microphone. Whereas if you listen to this. Well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional. And you're what they call can't win for losing. And what, what I'm hearing is there's actually, you're, you're getting a lot of the... Um, reflective ambience of this little space in this kitchen, you're, you're just hearing more of that. So that could have just been, again, a combination of how the boom operator was holding the boom. He wasn't quite positioned correctly on, on the mouth. When you use shotgun microphones for capturing dialogue, these things are typically using a, um, uh, a polar pattern known as supercardioid or hypercardioid. It's a very, very small window. Think of it like Sh having shallow depth of field when you're shooting f2.8. You know, you've got a very small, limited window of being in focus. Well, with a shotgun mic, like those are those long, long, skinny microphones. There's one above me here. Same concept. There's a very small, de shallow depth of field where you're capturing full-bodied sound of a voice. And then if you're just slightly off to the right or left, you're just not getting it. So that could be what we're hearing here. So to even these out, it just bothers me a little. And to give this one a little bit more warmth, we're going to have to do some individual equaliz equalization on this, okay? Let's skip to the next clip here. Besides, I gave you the tools. I gave you the phones. I gave you the scripts. I told you what to do, and I told you how to do it. All right. And you can hear the same thing here. Now, what's interesting, notice that when he moves forward, you can actually hear the sound changing. It gets progressively closer and warmer. Besides, I gave you the tools. I gave you the phones. I gave you the scripts. I told you what to do, and I told you how to do it. Okay. Now, to even that out would take a lot of uh, intelligent keyframing. I don't know that we're going to tackle that whole process today. It's a bit more on the advanced side, but that's what you would do. You would actually keyframe probably the amount of the equalization at the beginning of the clip and roll it off simultaneously as he moves closer to the camera. All right. And it's the same keyframing that you would do, whether you're adjusting opacity or position. But in this case, it would be um, uh, either the, um, the wet dry balance uh, of an effect that you've added or something to that nature. But the keyframing concept itself is the same, all right? And then the global uh, track that contains both of their dialogue or bits of both of their dialogue. It, what she did is she paid me what she owed me for her half. And now you're gonna pay me what you owe me for yours. All right. Oh, lost it. Now that ain't my fault. Look, I this one I can hear. You could, There's some rumble in there. I don't know if that's coming through on the stream, but you can hear it's almost like the boom operator <laughs> moved and that you could just, there's this like. Boom, boom. Look, I don't care. What? Don't. What? Don't. It almost sounds like a heartbeat. It's not a heartbeat. There's there, something caused some kind of rumble there. So again, we could treat that individually. There's a couple things we could do to kind of finesse that to fix it. Um, but you could just hear that these are the kind of things that we're listening for when we're trying to mix the sound to video here, right? If we're, if we're trying to make this better, all right? Nice. This is great ear training. I've never listened for nuance and audio capture, Eric. Yes, I mean, and that's, that's the key. And that's really what sets apart, you know, a, a, a pro sounding mix production versus an amateur one. You have to critically listen because the idea is we want that dialogue to sound consistent. We don't want one to sound echoey and the other to sound dry, one to sound mid-rangey and the other to sound overly bassy. They should effectively sound the same. Now, yes, you do want per potentially ambient changes. And depending upon how we, um, you know, we can also decide like panning position, maybe when it's in this kind of uh, wide shot, you want it to feel more like they're on either side. Maybe you really want the audio to be centered. That's typically where I would put it. I don't use too much um, panning for dialogue unless it's part of the scene. Like when you when you have people on the phone, 
that kind of thing. And they're the camera is shooting people in different, you know, uh, different sort of quadrants of the shot, right? You know, if you're using your like rule of thirds, if someone's kind of on the left and the other person's on the right, maybe then you take advantage of stereo panning. Um, typically, though, for dialogue, you just want it in the center because that's that's your story. That's your message. and it, it needs to be clear all the time. All right. OK, so um, just because uh, Eric asked here, I'm going to jump a little jump ahead a little bit and just kind of talk about compression. All right. Now, compression uh, for audio means something very different uh, than sort of like file compression. All right. So compression for audio is we're trying to adjust the dynamics, the dynamic range. OK. And what I mean by that is now, again, these performances are are fairly consistent. OK, but. Think about the way that you normally talk. If you're speaking kind of in a normal tone like this, and then you get excitable and you're shouting, right? Your volume, and if you were to look at a waveform, the dynamic values of your volume jump all over the place, right? If you're just kind of speaking like a robot and very monotone and not changing and being very, very consistent, it's just going to be flatlined like this and you don't have to worry about controlling dynamics. But we don't speak that way. I mean, some may. So you use compression to even out those peaks and to kind of squeeze everything so that it's just very present. Another way to think of this is kind of in your face, right? Just very consistent and even, all right? And when you have multiple pieces of dialogue, all right, this is an opportunity, again, to just make everything very, very consistent. Now, before removing noise, typically, again, I would apply compression, um, to everything after all of the clips are cleaned up. But because it was asked, I'm going to go ahead and jump into this right now. Here's what I would do to kind of bring all this dialogue together so that it's just kind of consistently dynamically evened out. We're going to add um, our basic two bottled compressor to this group dialogue fader here. OK, so I'm going to come up to dialogue. Let's click on our fly out arrow here and we're going to go under amplitude and compression tube modeled compressor all right and then we'll double click on the effects slot to bring up the compressor itself all right now compressors are quite honestly you know if you think about hurdles in illustration like what what, what is your main hurdle in illustration or using you know is it color? Is it brush, stroke, width, whatever? Um, similarly with photography, like what's your, you know, is it understanding lighting and aperture? Well, with audio mixing, compression is is that hurdle for most people. It's probably, it's the most, it's the most challenging thing to understand. Um, you have to understand how it works. And then once you understand how to set it, it'll change the way you mix forever. For basic compression, for all compression, there are five essential parameters that determine how that compressor works. Threshold, ratio, attack release, and then output or makeup gain. Threshold, this is, this is phase one. The threshold means this is the point at which compression begins. So what you see here, if you look at this very simplified interface, so over here on the left, this is the this is the uh, the input level of our audio when we're playing it back, and I can go ahead and play this so you can see it doing something. Is she paid me what she owed me for her half? Okay, so that's the input level of the dialogue of the audio coming in, and then this meter here, this is what's called our gain reduction meter, and this is showing you how many dB above the threshold you're going. Now your audio must exceed whatever this threshold is, in order for compression to begin. And it works in tandem with this setting here called the ratio, all right? Now, I don't know why we have this X here. That's really unnecessary. But you'll always see the ratio as something like 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 5 to 1, 8 to 1, all right? We're going to set this to 3 to 1. This is typically what I'll use for dialogue for something like this, for an episodic piece. And what that means is that for every three decibels above the threshold, all right, it's one dB at the output, okay? So what that means is that I must see this light, this would be three right here, I must see at least three decibels 
of gain reduction going on there for this to be compressing at all. If I don't see any lights in this meter right here, we are not compressing. And this is typically what happens to people is they don't adjust the threshold correctly. They don't know what the ratio is. And then they're just adjusting things like output gain. They're like, oh yes, it's louder. A compressor is effectively an amplifier, but you must, com you must actually adjust the threshold properly to make sure that it's actually doing something. Now the attack time is how quickly the compression begins to kick in. In other words, once that signal exceeds the threshold, and you'll see what I mean in a second here, the attack is how fast it compresses or squashes it down. And then the release is, after it's compressed the signal, how long, once it drops below the threshold, it takes to go back to normal. So in this case, it's currently set to 10 milliseconds. So that means once it exceeds that threshold, within 10 milliseconds, it's gonna squash that audio down. And then after 100 milliseconds, it's going to release it back to its normal volume, assuming that it's fallen below the threshold. Confused? <laughs> like I said, it takes a minute to wrap your head around this. Now, I have uh, discrete compression training videos on my YouTube channel, Jason Levine Video, as well as on various masterclasses and things here on Adobe Live and the Creative Cloud YouTube channel. So you can just search for me and look for audio compression. I can also tell you there's an audio 101 lesson. It's, it's lesson eight, audio 101 on my YouTube channel. It's all about, it's an hour on compression. So you, you'll, you'll walk away from there knowing how to do it. Very difficult to teach this in 10 minutes, but that's the basic concepts here. So again, with a three to one, we need to exceed the threshold by at least three decibels to be compressing at all. Now for dialogue like this, I typically set this to around nine milliseconds. And then for my release time, I'm gonna go a little bit longer. Let's do around 155 milliseconds here, all right? We're gonna wind this back and I'm gonna start adjusting my threshold slider here. All right, probably gonna need to be somewhere around minus 30-ish. And once I see the gain reduction exceeding three, I know that I'm working, that this is happening properly. All right, let's take a listen. I'm gonna start to adjust this in real time. Here we go. No, oh, let me let me solo all three of these. I don't even have any of the money. Amy just, she split and took it all. She... Well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional, and you're what they call can't win for losing. Okay. She tell you she took it all? She took the whole damn score? Now you can see I'm peak reduction. My peak reduction here is hitting almost minus 12. So remember, for every 3 dB above the threshold, it's 1 dB at the output. So that means when it exceeds 3, it's 1 decibel at the output. When it exceeds 6, it's 2 decibels at the output. When it exceeds 9, it's three decibels at the output. And when it exceeds 12, it's four decibels at the output. Does that make sense? Now I'm squeezing this down pretty significantly just so that you can kind of hear what this is doing. But you should be able to hear that it's really kind of squeezing things down and it's going to even them out. Now, once you squeeze it down, this is where you then use the output gain to kind of bring it back to that sort of original level. So everything should just kind of sound consistent. Now we've got noise and other things that we need to treat here. Pay no attention to that. We're just trying to kind of even out those levels because they are getting a little bit excitable, right? And hit that one guy's kind of, he's got that kind of angry growl. And the other dude, he, he's like, ah. right. So different tonalities affect the waveforms differently. We're just trying to get everything very even and kind of in your face all at once. All right, let's keep listening here and we'll make adjustments accordingly. What she did is she paid me what she owed me for her half. And now you're gonna pay me what you But I, I didn't get any of the money. Why, why do I have to pay you if I don't get any of it? <laughs> oh, you got it, Liv, you got it. You just lost it. You just lost it. And that ain't my fault. Besides, I gave you the tools. I gave you the phones, I gave you the scripts. I told you what to do. Okay, so case in point here. Notice with this off, how much kind of louder he is. Besides, I gave you the tools. I gave you the phones. I gave you the scripts. Let's turn this on. So again, now we're squeezing this three to one, right? Listen to the difference in amplitude. Besides, 
I gave you the tools. I gave you the phones. I gave you the scripts. I told you what to do, and I told you how to do it. All right. Now, I might back off the threshold a little, but this is where we're going to use that output gain to kind of make it maybe not quite as loud as it was, but just to kind of bring everything up just a little bit, again, to kind of just even out the overall sound of everything. And we can still make individual tweaks to levels of the individual clips. You know, if one clip is just particularly a little bit too loud, that's where we can adjust those on an independent basis. But I don't have the money. But I don't care. But Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. A Amy just, she split and took it all. She... <sighs> well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional. And you're what they call can't win for losing. She tell you she took it all. She took the whole damn score. All right. So you can see now like everything's kind of sitting right there. It feels like it's a bit you're like really in the conversation now. All right. Now we could back off on this threshold. I'm, I'm compressing this a little bit more for the stream just so that it's a little bit more obvious to you. But what we're trying to do is, again, even out the dynamic range. He's getting excitable. He's kind of in that angry voice. And, you know, watch any good film. I always I always reference some of the best sound mixing is is in the. Um, the first two, um, oh my God, <laughs> Keanu Reeves, ah, Matrix, the first two Matrix movies. And you'll notice that when there's, you know, whispering or shouting, the volume, the amplitude is the same. All right. That's kind of a key of using compression properly so that you're not having to lean in to hear it. Right. That's a good use of compression. All right. So we're, dare I say, flattening the curve above the threshold. <laughs> How inappropriate, Cal. No, but yes, actually, that's that's basically what you're doing. Very, that's actually a really good. You are, you're you're trying to flatten out those dynamic peaks. That's that is exactly what you're doing. Now, just to be real clear here, when you hear like compressor limiter or compression or versus limiting, a compressor limiter is the same effect. They're the same thing. The difference is the ratio. For ratios below. 10 to 1, you are compressing. For ratios above 10 to 1, so 10 to 1, 12 to 1, 20 to 1, infinity to 1, you are limiting, all right? So the ratio is determining the difference in, and, and what that, the difference is, think of it this way. When you're compressing up to around 10 to 1, you're squashing peaks down. When you're limiting 20 to 1, you're not only squashing peaks down, but more importantly, you're raising quieter audio up. So compression is you're bringing the top peaks down. Limiting is you're bringing the softer stuff up. All right. So you might say, well, then why not just limit everything? Well, because limiting also has some other byproducts of just making everything very, very intense. You know, you don't necessarily need to limit voices unless there's like you know, screaming and, and, and whispering on the same track or something like that. Limiting drums, limiting music, different, and sometimes limiting voices. But in the case of dialogue, you're generally not limiting dialogue, you're compressing dialogue. You're just trying to even out or flatten out those dynamic peaks, okay? Sam, is there anything about Premiere you don't have a video for? <laughs> uh, there are very few things. Uh, I'm sure there, there there are a few, I'm sure. Um, I don't have anything specific to captioning that's new. You have to go back about five or six years. I've been having a lot of requests for that. So at some point, I'm going to need to tackle those. All right. Yasunari, how are you? Okay. Richard Newberry, presets make it much easier for novices. Okay, so um, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good comment, uh, Richard. And actually, I'm gonna tackle that right now. So here under the preset menu, we do have a lot of presets, all right? And these can be good sort of starters for adding compression. Here's the problem with this, all right? And this is not based on Premiere, this is not based on Audition or Pro Tools or Final Cut or anything. These, these are just random values. In other words, there's no specific threshold setting for dialogue because it's all based on how you recorded it. So if you were to go into something like the voice leveler, all right, and here I, I know my set, so what are we at? Minus 32, six, 
three nine one fifty five. Okay, so that's that's where we need to be. Let's go into like, oh, you know what? I think I want to level things out. Let's go into the voice leveler here. All right. Well, first and foremost, look at what the voice leveler did. The threshold is minus 10. The ratio is 12 to 1. So remember, I need to have at least 12 decibels of gain reduction happening on screen for this to be doing anything, right? So if I play this back. What she did is she paid me what she owed me for her half. And now you're going to pay me what Let's you turn got. off the effect. I, I didn't get any of the money. Why, why do I have to pay you if I don't get any <laughs> of it? On. Oh, you got it, Liv. Off. You just On. Lost you off. just lost it. It's not doing anything. Why isn't it doing anything? Because the threshold isn't set correctly, right? So you would have to then know, ah, I need to adjust the threshold. So if you adjust the threshold. And that ain't my fault. Besides, I gave you the tools. I gave you the phones. I gave you the scripts. I told you what to do, and I told you how to do it. But I don't have the money. Okay. I would have to go in here and adjust that threshold. And again, based on this ratio of 12 to 1, for it to be working correctly, that gain reduction meter has to be hitting 12 or going beyond it. All right. So I love presets. I'm the first to say presets are a great starter. For compression, it's it's a hard sell for me because I, and I've seen I've seen this in so many countless training videos on YouTube. I can't even tell you where someone's like, okay, so I'm going to take the leveler here and let's put it on and hit play, and look at that. It's better. But I don't care. It's not compressing. It's not doing anything. Now in this particular one, voiceover, there's added gain here. So you've amplified everything four decibels, but you're not compressing anything. All right. So you amplified the voice, but you also amplified noise. You didn't change the dynamic values at all. So vo presets are amazing. I fully agree. Understanding how the effect works, though, will allow you to leverage those presets more effectively. And really, if there's if there's two things you need to know, it's threshold and ratio, right? Threshold is the point at which compression begins, and the ratio is for every X decibel that it exceeds that threshold, three, three, four, eight in this case, it's one decibel at the output. If you understand those things, then go mad with the presets. Does that make sense? All right. Nuff is saying compression masterclass is the knowledge I never knew I needed. Yes. Adi Diaz, I've been editing with Premiere for years and I never use those tools. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Very glad to hear that. Love that. Okay. Yasudari. Oh, thank you very much. That's very cool. All right. Okay. So again, I'm I'm like absolutely, you know, pro presets. You've heard me say it on other ones here. But like I said, I think the one exception to just using them in a scenario where you effectively just get up and go is audio compression because it's so specific to understanding these two values. If you don't have these two values set correctly, the compressor is not doing anything. And there's plenty of these presets where there's a lot of output gain added. So you might hear like dialogue gets super loud and think, oh yeah, that compressor sounds amazing. But it's not It's not compressing, it's just amplifying. So what that means is when you go to export, you might have clipped meters or peaking meters and it's gonna, it's gonna get messy. It's not gonna be very good, okay? So we're back to where we were. I've set this back to our original settings here, okay? And this is again going to be an overall setting that we'll use to kind of even out all those dynamics. Very cool. All right. So I want to go into a little bit of um, equalization, okay? And uh, we're going to tackle both music and dialogue simultaneously. We've got about we've got about thirty minutes more here, and this should kind of inspire. I'm going to disable this uh, this effect for the moment here. This should this should kind of inspire you to to explore using equalization a bit more. And we're going to start by using this music track, okay? What is up, Desiree? Hey, Tunj. Eric, super helpful. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let's start over here with music one. I'm going to unmute this. All right. So take a listen to this music that we have on here. Bring this back up. Did I bring up the level? I did. Okay, here it is. Oh, 
Okay, so this creepy soundtrack here is something that I created with uh, my oft collaborator, Fet Fung. And you can hear, even when we were playing this before, like against dialogue, this just has, this got a lot of high end, it's got a lot of brightness to it. And as a result, it's conflicting with the vocal frequencies, okay? Now, yes, I could drop the level of that, obviously, but what I really wanna do in the case of this scene, we're trying to create tension, all right? So what I wanna do is I wanna kinda of darken this audio track. And in fact, I wanna get rid of all of the brightness and just kinda of leave those percussive, low end and low mid rangey tones, that kind of ominous kind of sound. And it's really gonna change the way this whole thing feels. So to do that, I'm going to leverage our parametric equalizer, okay, which you can find again by going to the filtering EQ section here and choosing parametric. Now I'm going to turn it back on. I've had it disabled and let me double click on this to bring it up. So all I did on this particular example here is I used what's called the low pass filter, okay? A low pass filter, sometimes used in conjunction with a high pass filter, is a way for you to allow low frequencies to pass through by cutting off high frequencies, okay? Low pass equals high cut. High pass, very burpy today, high pass is the opposite. High pass allows high frequency to pass through low cut. Cut, eliminate low frequencies. And you can see that I rolled off everything up to around 652 hertz. Now to put this in perspective, I've got all the dialogue back on here. Let's go ahead and bring this back to where it started, 24K. I've also adjusted this to cut 30 decibels per octave. I think the default is 24. This is just basically the aggressive, the aggression of the curve. Here's like 6 dB per octave. You can see it's like this a steeper curve, 12, an even steeper curve, 24, an even steeper curve, 30, all right? So really aggressively cutting off kind of at this centered frequency. So I'm gonna play this back and I'm just gonna start cutting these frequencies, going all the way down to 653 and listen to what this is doing, okay? Here we go. She's what they call professional. And you what they call can't wait for those. She did she took it off. She took the whole damn score. What she did is she paid me what she owed me for. Okay. Now you can hear the dialogue coming through more clearly, obviously, because we've eliminated all of the high end from there. Now, again, we still may need to adjust the volume level of this, but right away, before even adjusting volume, before adjusting amplitude. Now the dialogue is going to sit there much more comfortably. In fact, let's just bring this down to around minus eight. Perhaps. I didn't get any of the money. Why, why do I have to pay you if I don't get any of it? Oh, you got it, baby. You just lost it. You just lost it. And that ain't my fault. Besides, I gave you the tools. I gave you the phones. I gave you the scripts. I told you what to do, and I told you how to do it. Okay. Suddenly now, that dialogue is really poking through. Now, I'm not saying use a low pass for everything. This particular track, this is what it needed, right, to create that slightly more ominous feel. Now, this one also has a lot of kind of low-end rumbly bits. So if I wanted to eliminate some of that, not too much because I like it. That's kind of what's making this kind of ominous. We could theoretically use a high pass. Now, by the way, <laughs> interesting choice for me to start with these. These are very aggressive filters, all right? So don't think of this as like, oh, I'm just gonna low pass, high pass all of my stuff. That's a great way to equalize. Eh, I mean, perhaps we're gonna get into more parametric stylings when we get to the voice in just a second here, all right? But for eliminating large groups of frequencies, high pass and low pass are key, all right? So just a case in point, if I wanted to eliminate some of that kind of subsonic rumble, 
I could implement the high pass filter here. All right. So again, we're going to do the same thing. Well, I'll set this to 20, which you're not going to hear anyway. And then I'm going to start to roll off the low end. I'm using a slightly less aggressive curve. In fact, I might even do minus 18 here. All right. And take a listen to what this does. But Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. Amy just, she split and took it all. She... Well, I talked to Amy and she came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional. And you're what they call can't win for losing. She tell you she took it all? She took the whole damn score? What she did is she paid me what she owed me for her half. Actually, that sounds pretty sweet. So we got rid of all that subsonic rumble, which, you know, might be cool. Now, I, I don't mix in headphones typically, so I'm not listening through my subwoofer. Maybe I would back that off to around minus 80. But effectively, as you can see, what that's doing is everything below 124 hertz at 18 decibels per octave. So it would be way more aggressive if we did that. We're still letting some of that 120, 110, even to around 90, there's still a bit of that kind of percolating through. But essentially, after that, all of the subsonics are gone. So this is a good way to just kind of focus in this particular music track to create that kind of low, mid-range, ominous, consistent, right? This is a very tense scene. Now, let's play this back again with these both implemented. Let's start with it off. And then we'll kick it in. You're just going to hear how that dialogue pokes right through. But Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have to give money. Amy just, she split and took it all. She... Well, I talked to Amy and she came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional. And you're what they call can't win for losing. Okay. Pretty cool, right? Steve Hughes, is it possible to keyframe the EQ to bring the bass in as the scene progresses? Excellent question, Steve Hughes. And the answer to that, of course, is yes. Yes, you can. All right, now this is a slightly more advanced process here, uh, but we've got time, so I'm gonna show that to you. That's what the interactive nature of these streams is all about. So excellent question, Steve. Um, let me go ahead and while I'm at it, the one other element that I added to this was a little bit of ambient reverb. All right. And that's nothing really just to give it a little more space. So if we just solo this music, I'll let you hear what the reverb sounds like off and on. So here it is off first. And let's go ahead and turn it on. Right here, it's just a, it just sounds a little bit wider. All right. I could even give it a little more early reflection. Gives it a little bit more ambience. around 21 percent okay didn't change it significantly just it's nice with music sometimes to give it a little bit of a wash by adding a little bit of ambient reverb it's just gonna it's just gonna give it that kind of swirly i mean this whole thing is meant to be the way that i saw this scene i love this actor it, it's tense but it also kind of has this creepy 60s 70s you know like slasher film vibe i don't know why to me it just it feels like something dark is about to happen just the whole color and the grade and the look of the scene too kind of lends itself to that so a nice a nice wash of some reverb can can affect that okay so to answer steve's question is it possible to keyframe changes in your audio effects yes it is so i'm going to show you that now so what we're going to do is we're going to come down to the audio clip in question now again this is where Color coding is so, so important, right? Okay. And I'm going to zoom in here so you can see this a little bit more accurately. And under here, you'll see that we have this little button that says show keyframes. And if I click on that, you can see that we are allowed to see clip keyframes. All right. You can edit the current effect. And then you have for each of the applied slots, your parametric EQ, your studio reverb, and then your individual track keyframes, again, those are global for volume and mute and for pan. So in this case, with the parametric EQ, all right, if I wanted to uh, adjust any one of these particular parameters, I would select them here. And in this case, here's our, our low shelf frequency. Now, by the way, I want to point out, <laughs> and it just so happens because I'm using the high pass and low pass filter, um, for whatever reason, 
The high pass specifically and low pass filters are not part of the automation um, in this particular effect. It's just it's just native to this particular effect. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why. But it is. It's just this one particular effect here. All right. So that sucks. But um, that is the way it is. All right. So you have your low pass and high pass, low shelf, high shelf here. All the other parameters are adjustable. So just to kind of show it to you here. And you could, by the way, we could do that if you wanted to bring in the base with something like EQ1. You could do it that way. All right. In fact, here, I even maybe I'll even show you that. Uh, so let's do this. We'll do um, let's do our EQ1. Let's do our low shelf frequency. All right. So now this line that we see here represents, I'm trying to see if it's going to give us a, a little tool tip. Is it showing a, a tool tip here? Yes. So can you read that? Oh, it's, it's off screen. So right now we're at 40 Hertz. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Is this actually allowing me to do that? All right. And you'll see that it's now adjusting this frequency. These increments are very, very large between 40 Hertz and 2,500 Hertz. All right. So if I were to play this back, take a look here. This is our low shelf frequency. All right. Again, not the high pass frequency, the low shelf frequency. It is now automating that change over time. Take a look here. All right. I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to hit play and no hands. So those values changing. Okay. That's how you automate it. Again, unfortunately, the high pass and low pass frequencies, those are not part of the automation scheme specific to the parametric equalizer. I, I, I don't know why. I've asked before. I don't remember why that is. Um, but all the other parameters are. And similarly, for any other effect. So let's say that we wanted to um, adjust the reverb parameter over time. All right, let's go into Studio Reverb and let's affect the wet output level. This is something that you'll actually be able to hear pretty, pretty easily. All right, let's bring up the Studio Reverb here. So here's our wet setting. So let's set a keyframe. By the way, I'm hitting the Command key or Control key in Windows to set a keyframe. And by the way, it tells you the tooltip that it's currently at 42.89%. So I'm going to set a keyframe by hitting command. You can also just hit the keyframe button right there, add remove keyframe. I'm going to set command again, set another, and then I'm going to increase this. Now what is this level? 81%. Let's just do 100% wet right here pretty quickly. All right. So take a look at the wet slider here, and you should be able to hear this adjusting that wet parameter as we go. Here we go. it is. Okay. And if you're listening in headphones, it just got a little bit more echoey sounding. So we had just adjusted the wet balance uh, of the reverb over time. All right. Pretty cool. Nice. Awesome enough. Thank you very much. All right. So Steve, did that answer your question? Getting to see the animation. And again, it works. It works the same for all of these. Okay. Again, the one exception being that we don't allow you to automate the high pass and low pass. This is a really common thing because, you know, think about so much pop music uses this where you have that kind of like over time, really common. You just can't do it with that parametric. If you use a lot of your third party plugins that have low pass, high pass, you can typically do it in all of those. I'm a big fan of Waves and whether it's the uh, Waves SSL EQ, Man American EQ, all of these allow you to automate the low pass and high pass filter parameters. Just for whatever reason, our parametric, we can't do that. Okay. All right. So that's parametric EQ using low pass and high pass for music to allow these things to kind of push through. 
We've got 15 more minutes. I'm going to show you some individual sweeping use of the parametric on that on that dialogue to get rid of that room room noise and and um, ambience. I want to do one more thing and show you just one more thing with the second piece of music that we have here. So while we've got this kind of creepy ominous thing, there was this other music track. these creepy choirs. All right. Now I'm not going to get into all of it. I just want to show you that in terms of sound design, th that's all this is. It's, it's just a loop of these creepy Mellotron choirs. Oh, is there actually noise between the joins there? I guess there is. I didn't even notice that. I need to put some crossfades in between there smooth those out. Might as well do that right now. Um, if you're hearing stuff like that, and actually, I don't I don't know if these are going to apply. Let's see if they do. I didn't uh, I didn't leave myself enough to crossfade between them. Yeah, that'll work. I'm just taking the constant power and dragging this crossfade between these clips to eliminate that little snap, crackle, pop that you heard in there. All right. That was because they were joined at the edit boundaries and they were not on a what's known as a zero crossing. <laughs> okay, now it's smooth. Okay. And in the track mixer here, just to give this a little something extra, I used a combination of analog delay and flange. So the delay is going to give this again repeats. Whoops, it's going to repeat this over time. And you're not really going to hear this because it's just one consistent tone, but it's going to provide this kind of feedbacky echo. So let's go ahead and turn this on and take a listen. Adds a little bit of distortion in there. And then under flanger, I used this effect to, again, kind of really dirty things up. Now, here's what it sounds like with just this. I did a basic setting here of a very slow flange. Now, a couple of key elements with using a flanger understanding how the feedback works and the modulation rate. The modulation rate is that it's displayed in Hertz or beats, but that's the period in which you're getting that kind of rotating swirling effect. So to be able to really hear what modulation rate you need, what it's doing, increase your feedback first. It might get a little loud, so you may need to adjust your wet dry here. All right, and then adjust the modulation rate and you'll hear what it does. Higher modulation rates, they're gonna vibrate very quickly. Slow it down and just take a listen, you'll hear what this is doing. All right. So that's at like 12 hertz. All right, and I have it around 0.4. Creepy, slow, dark, ominous, love it. And then in conjunction with that music over top of it now. Okay. Now, one of the other things that I might do here is for the first appearance of this, I'm hovering over the um, the fade that I placed on there, the constant power fade, and you'll notice that my cursor changes icons. This is going to allow me to adjust the duration of that fade. So I want this to kind of fade on very slowly. All right. 
So when it appears, let's bring the dialogue back in here. It's going to sound like this. She tell you she took it all? She took the whole damn score? What she did is she paid me what she owed me for her half. But I, don't, I didn't get any of the money. Why, why do I have to pay you if I don't get any of it? Oh, you got it, man. You got it. You just lost it. All right. Okay. So now that we've done that, checking back here, fantastic. Leo saying nice. All right. Tunch, yes, works the same in AU. Okay. Let's tackle some individual EQ here. It's probably going to be our last thing, and then we'll place back that uh, compressor on there for this first clip. Now, this is going to actually use a little bit of that essential sound panel because I want to fix um, the boxiness of this particular voice over here. Well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional. All right. So what we want to do first, before we attack, before we tackle the boxiness, it also, it, it needs some, it needs some EQ, but it also needs some denoising. So part of that boxiness is, again, it's capturing the room ambience. Now you can try and eliminate some of that with EQ. Unfortunately, and I can just hear this by hearing the nature of his voice, he's got a lot of richness in that low mid range. So if I try and cut out the boxiness, the, the, the room sound with EQ, it's going to cut out some of the fundamentals of his speaking voice as well. So instead, I'm going to use a combination of denoise from Essential Sound to get rid of some of that background ambience that's very different from the previous speaker. And then I'm going to use a little bit of our de-reverb effect, all right? And de-reverb is very effective for attenuating or softening room ambience or room reflection or room echo, all right? Can it remove very echoey large space reverbs? I mean, with varying degrees of, of success, yes. Where it's really effective, though, is just for softening or just just gently eliminating some of that. You know, if you're sometimes like in a kitchen, kitchens are notoriously echoey or bright. D-reverb can just take the edge off of that and just kind of refocus something like a voice, all right? So first thing we're going to do is with Essential Sound Panel here, I got my clip selected down here. And I'm going to tell Essential Sound that this is dialogue. And when I do that, it's now going to reveal to me a whole series of effects and filters that I would commonly use to process dialogue. And the one that we're going to focus on is in this section here called Repair, where we have a whole bunch of options, Reduce Noise, Rumble, Dehum, DS, and Reduce Reverb. And we're going to focus on the first two here. So first time for what I'm going to do is I'm going to set an in and out point on my timeline for this dialogue because I just want to kind of loop between these pieces here. And we're going to engage reduce noise. I'm going to set this to zero first. We're going to play this back. And I'm just going to adjust that, uh, adjust that noise reduction slider until it gets rid of enough of that room noise. All right. And then we're going to use the D reverb. Here we go. Well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional. And you're what they call can't win for losing. <laughs> well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional. And you're what they call can't win for losing. All right, let's turn it off. <laughs> well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional. And you're what they call can't win for losing. <laughs> well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional. Really nice. It's around 6.2% here. Or it's really 62%. Um, nicely kind of got rid of some of that. Now, if you're not in headphones, you're probably not hearing it. What's cool about this is if you are in headphones, it's not dramatically or really in any way changing the sound of the voice here. OK, that's kind of the key. We don't want it to be artifacted. Now, the second step is reducing the reverb again, some of that room boxiness. So similarly, I'm going to start with this at zero. Let's play this back. And then I only need to go around 20 percent to just kind of get rid of some of that room edginess. Here we go. And you're what they call can't win for losing. Well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional. And you're what they call can't win for losing. Well, I talked to All Amy. Right. Let's turn everything me. off. Here we go. You see, she's what they call professional. And you're what they call can't win for losing. 
Well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. They, you see, she's what they call professional. And you're what they call can't win for losing. All right. If you're in headphones, you could definitely hear that. So we got rid of a lot of that, just the ambient sound. Could have been an air conditioner, any number of things when they were doing this live. And then reduce some of that room boxiness with reduced reverb. All right. Sweet. Exponential fade is my fave. Nice, Eric. All right. Now, in conjunction with that, and these two audio clips that live on this track have the exact same characteristics, I'm also going to use a track parametric equalizer to, again, further get rid of. There's just some low mid-range boxiness that um, that I'm just, I'm just not loving. All right. So let's go into our filter in EQ, parametric EQ. By the way, why the parametric? I love this effect because one, it's very musical sounding, it's very subtle, but it's very effective and um, it really gives you a good, you can get a very good audible sense of like what frequencies sound like, particularly as you sweep through. So we're going to do two things here. I want to boost up a little bit of the low end to give him a little bit more warmth. Again, because the, the how this was tracked, we're just getting a bit of the brightness from the room, but also get rid of some of that low end. That I can hear in the low end, there's something that's resonating, all right? There's a sympathetic resonance. There's something in his voice that actually with the room is causing, it's known as a sympathetic beat or a sympathetic resonance. If you've ever, if you sing in the shower, you know, there's certain frequencies, notes that you'll hit where it just rings. Now to your ear, it sounds good. When you're tracking a voice in a room, if, the, if your voice is ringing with the room, that's not good. The room is resonating. So we want to find that resonance and get rid of it. And my guess is it's somewhere between uh, somewhere between two, 200, 275, 300, somewhere in that range. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the second band of this parametric EQ. All right. We're going to use a fairly narrow bandwidth. Okay. And by the way, just to showcase what bandwidth means, that's how narrow or how much it affects adjacent frequencies. This would be a wide bandwidth with a very narrow bandwidth. And I want to very narrowly identify the problem frequency and then take it out. All right. So the way that you find those problem frequencies is you're first going to boost and then you're going to sweep, which means adjust the frequencies left to right until you hear it resonating. And once you hear that, then you pull it out, all right? So let's go ahead, we're gonna start at zero here. Let's start this at around 170. Let's play this back and listen. Jamie, she came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional, and you're what they call can't win for losing. Well, I talked to Amy, she came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional, and you're what they call can't win for losing. Well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional. And you're what they call can't win for losing. Now, I don't know if you could hear that. We've only got two more minutes. You start to get this almost abundance of distortion. That was his low, low end of his voice at 250 hertz. Maybe it's even a little bit higher. Resonating with the room. And I pulled that out uh, 14 dB. All right. Similarly now, or dissimilarly, now we're going to add back in just a little bit of, um, of warmth, of low-end warmth, with a Q of around 4. Let's go. I already know what I want to do. Around 100 hertz. And you're going to see I'm just going to boost up 100 just to warm this up ever so slightly. Well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional. And you're what they call can't win for losing. All right. Well, I talked to Turn it off. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional, and you're what they call can't win for losing. All right. So now, if we were to disable everything, here's the before. <laughs> well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional, and you're what they call can't win for losing. Well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional, and you're what they call can't win for losing. Right? so much better, significantly better. Okay, so now we've done that, all right? You've seen how we apply a little track parametric EQ. Let's go ahead and kick back in that global compressor right here, and let's just play this back and take a listen to what we got. But Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any 
any of the money. A Amy just, she split and took it all. She... Well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional. And you're what they call can't win for losing. She tell you she took it all? She took the whole damn score? What she did is she paid me what she owed me for her half. And now you're gonna pay me what you But, but I, I didn't get any of the money. Why, why do I have to pay you if I don't get any of it? Oh, you got it, Liv. You got it. You just lost it. You just lost it. And that ain't my fault. Besides, I gave you the tools. I gave you the phones. I gave you the scripts. I told you what to do, and I told you how to do it. All right. So my friends, that unfortunately is all the time we have. All right. Hopefully you learned a couple of new tips and tricks today. Again, I invite you to check out my audio 101 series on um, Jason Levine video, which is my YouTube channel. You can find again, additional masterclasses here on Adobe Live. So much more coming up. We've got the Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge coming up next. So until then, stick around, have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you again next time. Thanks everybody for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.